So I, I'd like to talk for about 20 minutes or so about a, an initiative that we started here to try to uh, summarize the ecological and economic impacts of invasive forest pests, and also to list some policy options for how, many, how we might deal with that, with that problem. Uh, first, let me tell you about the Cary Institute for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with it. It's a uh, independent, nonprofit research and education center We're in Millbrook, New York, which is in the Hudson Valley. We have scientists working on all sorts of uh, aspects of ecology of, uh, uh, well, throughout, throughout the country, throughout the world, actually. But um, there are several of us working on invasive uh, forest insects and diseases because I personally think this is the, the largest problem that intact eastern forests face at this point. You know, we have climate change, we have air pollution, we have all sorts of problems, but this is the one that's really causing the most damage in the forest right now. So that's why we're trying to do something about it. So I'll just uh, proceed here. I do want to thank uh, two collaborators, Kathy Fallon Lambert, Lambert and Marissa Weiss from the Science Policy Exchange. Uh, SPE, the Science Policy Exchange, is, a, is an interface organization that tries to take science and use it in a policy setting. So they're helping me with the outreach portion of this. And we have a number of funders, USDA, Doris Duke, SM Kirby Foundation, that have helped support this work. So I do want to acknowledge them. So uh, I'm sure that all, all of you are familiar with invasive species, so I'm, I'm sure I don't have to spend a lot of time on this problem, but we certainly had a, a, a series of forest pests that have invaded uh, the U.S. and northeastern forests in particular, uh, and many of them the common parlance in the, in the language now, chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease, gypsy moth, those things everybody knows about. There's more that most of the public don't know about that you probably do, things like balsam oleodelgid, certainly emerald ash borer, hemlock oleodelgid, beech bark disease. So we could, we could go on and on with this list. There's a lot of them. And there's, there's others that are uh, potential uh, problems here. They haven't spread out in any uh, broad way yet, but they, they're sort of waiting in the wings, things like Asian longhorn beetle sudden oak death, which is out in the western U.S., and uh, Cyrex wood wasp, which has had a few outbreaks in, in New York, but hasn't had a widespread uh, infestation yet. So we have a, a lot of these things. There's continued uh, invasion by these things. So, and that was uh, brought together in a paper by Ockham et al. in 2010. They were looking at the country as a whole, at least the, the lower 48 states, and they plotted the cumulative number of insect pests uh, that have uh, come into the country, have established in the country way back in, into the 1800s. And you can see there's a pretty straight line, that red line on the slide there. Uh, so these, these things continue to accumulate. And, and remember that they don't go away for the most part. So these things are, we're just building up the numbers of these things in the forest. The brown line at the bottom um, shows a straight increase. This is the wood boring insects. Um, they're increasing, that's a subset of the, of the group that's in the red line there. And that was increasing also until about 85 when there was an uptick in that, in the slope of that line. So they're increasing at a faster rate now. And that's, that, that increase in uh, invasion by wood boring insects, and uh, you certainly know of some of them, emerald ash borer, uh, Asian longhorn beetle, et cetera. That uptick in the, in the slope there uh, is due to the uh, prevalence, the increased prevalence of containerized shipping around the globe. So as you know, most goods are moved around the globe. And, large ships containing shipping containers. All those shipping containers take, uh, include wood packing material, crates and pallets and things like that. And inside all that wood packing material is the potential for uh, wood boring insects to be hiding out. So that's why we have an increased uh, infestation by wood borers in the last decade or two. So it's an increasing problem. It doesn't seem to be abating in any way. Uh, it's it's uh, not geographically spread in an even way. You can, from this map, uh, which was published in 2013, you can see, well, a couple things. One is that every place in the U.S. that has a forest uh, has a forest pest problem. But the problem is particularly severe here in the Northeast and particularly in New York State. So, you know, where I live is in that big blue spot in South East in New York, so you can see why I'm particularly sensitive to this problem. But throughout the Northeast, we have a lot of these pests. Um, why? Uh, I think that nobody knows for sure, but probably it's because we have a lot of trade. This is all coming in on global trade, of course. Um, we have a lot of trade from those eastern ports, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, et cetera. 
And also the tree species that we have here in the Northeast and the Eastern U.S. in general are similar to tree species that are found in Europe and in Asia. So we have common genera of trees uh, across the continents, and therefore a pest that's uh, uh, evolved in, let's say, China uh, gets on a boat, comes to New York, and it finds a tree that is uh, similar to the tree that it infested in China and has the potential to explode because it's released from the defenses that would have evolved against the pest in, in its home range and also released from enemies that might control it in its home range. So that's when we have the infestation problem. We know that this is a big problem economically. The paper we just put together um, summarizes the economic impacts. Um, they're estimated at over $5 billion a year. Surprisingly to me, it, the forestry impacts were rather small compared to the urban and suburban impacts. When you think about impacts on lots of trees, you think it's probably a forestry problem. But actually the largest costs are borne by homeowners and municipal governments, and those costs are due to several things. One is they have to take down and replace street trees and yard trees that die, and that's expensive. And there's also lost property value associated with the, the death of trees in urban and suburban areas. Uh, the, the photos at the bottom are from Worcester, Mass. Uh, the photo at the left is a, a photo of a tree line in Worcester. Worcester, as you know, probably had an outbreak of uh, Asian longhorn beetle. I think it was first uncovered in 2008 or some, somewhere around there. Um, and they've taken over 30,000 trees out of Worcester, Mass, mostly maples, and they're still removing trees. But on the right is what the neighborhood, same neighborhood looked like, same vantage point um, after the trees are removed. So you can see what that does to the aesthetics of the neighborhood and what it would do to property value. Just uh, trees are important for property value. We know that this $5 billion a year figure is an underestimate. For one thing, it doesn't include the diseases. It only includes the insects. But there, it doesn't include any of the non-market values either, the things that uh, people appreciate about trees that, uh, uh, that uh, aren't e easy to quantify in economic sense, you know, the aesthetic values, the recreation values, and things like that. So we know it's an underestimate, but it's still a big problem. Of course, the poster child for economic impacts is the emerald ash borer. This is the costliest pest that's been introduced in the country so far. It killed hundreds of millions of ash trees. It's still spreading throughout the, throughout the U.S. You can see it was, it, this was introduced into the Detroit area, probably in the mid-90s sometime. It was discovered in the early 2000s. But you can see the, the red dots are all counties where, where this has been found, and it's still continuing to spread. It's in our area in, in southeastern New York. It's gotten into New England as well. And I, most people assume that it's going to continue to spread until it runs out of ash trees. So it could be possible for the extirpation or the near extirpation of the entire fraction of genus from, from the U.S. For us, is somewhere around $13 billion through 2020. So this is said, the most expensive pest that we've introduced so far. Ecological impacts, so I'm an ecologist, and this is, I got into this because I was studying ecological impacts. Uh, this is, introduced pest diseases are the only disturbance, really, that can eliminate or nearly eliminate major canopy tree species in the, in the matter of a couple of decades. So to me, that's the major disturbance. Um, species right out of the ecological uh, mix in, in forest. The photo at the right is a chestnut grove from North Carolina. I think that picture was taken in the late 1800s. So that's what chestnuts used to look like. Now, you're lucky to find a chestnut that's uh, 10 inches across now. Chestnut is just a, an example of a tree species that's been taken out of the picture by, by an invasive pest. In many areas of the mid-Atlantic states, chestnut was the dominant tree species, and uh, now it's gone. So there's a, a number of different effects other than just removing the tree species. Um, and this, this diagram sort of gives an idea of the kinds of things that, that scientists look at when they're looking at the effects. So, so up in the upper left, you have the pest or pathogen that damages a host tree species. It either damages or kills it entirely. And then we have short-term effects that can happen, and we're pretty familiar with those. Those are the things that we see happening right in front of our eyes. Um, and those are caused by the death of the tree and the uh, loss of control of vegetation over the nutrient and carbon cycling in the, in the ecosystem. 
And so it changes things like structure, productivity, nutrient cycling, it changes the food web in the ecosystem. Um, and it also can change uh, the, the ecosystem characteristics in embedded ecosystems like streams or lakes or wetlands that are in the forest where, where this tree decline is happening. But in addition to these short-term effects, there are long-term effects because unlike other disturbances, these pests get into the system and they stay in the system and they're concentrating usually on a particular host species. So by doing that, they reduce the vigor or uh, extirpate that species and then other species compensate. This. So there's usually uh, competition amongst, amongst the tree species and some other species is happy to take the canopy space that's liberated by the tree that's declining. So you have a shift in forest species composition. Since the trees are all sort of unique in the way that they affect the ecosystem, whether it's wildlife habitat or nutrient cycling or productivity, uh, that change in tree, tree species composition can also change the forest ecosystem characteristics. So we have both these short-term effects and the long-term effects uh, that we're trying to understand. Okay, and you know, the, in terms of the science of this, there are um, a number of ways to try to study the long-term effects. The short-term effects are fairly easy because they can fit into a short-term research grant to, to study these things. Uh, the long-term effects are more difficult, and there would be things like chronosequence studies where you, where you try to find a series of stands at, at um, various stages of infestation by the pest, or modeling studies. And we're working on both of those in the Catskills and in the, in the Adirondacks and the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So we're trying to understand these longer-term effects. Uh, one of the, the poster pests, I guess, for, for ecological effects, one of the best studied is the hemlock woolly adelgid, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. This was introduced probably in the early 1900s in uh, Virginia. It didn't spread very fast, but by the time the 1980s rolled around, it had gotten into areas where hemlock was more abundant, and it started spreading rapidly throughout the mid-Atlantic state. It's just a tiny insect that uh, 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 attacks the, the hemlock at the base of the needle and basically sucks the carbohydrates out of the, of the cells at the base of the needle. Of course, those of you who have seen it recognize it as the woolly white woolly uh, uh, backs that you see underneath the, uh, the twigs of the hemlock. Um, it's been spreading north and, uh, and south, both from the, its original introduction point. In the map there, the green is the range of hemlock, and the brown is the range of the adelgid. And uh, you can see that it's spreading throughout the range. It seems to be limited on the northern end by cold temperatures. Uh, and so it's spreading more slowly as it gets into central New York and Southern New England, it's, it's spreading a little bit more, more slowly, but uh, we know a couple of things are happening. One is that the cold winter nights, which knock it back, those are getting less common because of climate change. And the second thing, we, we know that the um, adelgid itself is evolving cold tolerance, so that the populations at the northern end of the range are more cold tolerant than the ones at the southern end of the range. And this is surprising, but this, in, this insect is, is all parthenogenetic. There's no uh, sexual reproduction in this thing, but nonetheless, it's still evolving as it goes along. And uh, so the expectation is that this thing will eventually spread throughout the range of hemlock. It seems to be quite lethal. Um, in the southeast, uh, uh, they found that when the hemlock tree gets infested, it's usually dead within four or five years. Up at the northern end of the range, it seems to be taking longer. It's more variable as to how long these hemlocks can survive. We have some at the institute here that have had the disease for 15 years, they're, they're looking pretty bad and they're eventually going to die probably within five years or so, but it's not as fast as it is in the southeast. And that probably has to do with the cold temperatures and the ability of the insects to reproduce. But the impact is not just on the, um, on the tree itself. Uh, when you take the tree out of the system, a lot of things happen. It reverberates through the ecosystem. So hemlock is one of our prime old growth species. So when you take that out of the system, you're losing old growth forest and setting back succession. Some bird species are more or less obligate on hemlock forests, like the uh, black-throated green warble that you see at the lower right there. Um, so those have declined by over 90% in, in Connecticut as a result of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, it, it changes nutrient cycling and carbon storage in, in ecosystems. That's the kind of thing that I study. I won't bore you with long, long detail about how that happens. But because of the streams that are embedded in these hemlock forests and because hemlocks often grow along streams, 
the death of the hemlock can open up the stream, warm it up, and that can be that can have an impact on cold water fish like brook trout. So that impact of the, this tiny little bug that eats this tree can reverberate throughout all aspects of the ecosystem. So I want to spend the rest of my time talking about how this problem might be solved. So we know that eradication of established pests is almost impossible. We can slow their spread and buy some time, which might help us uh, develop um, biological control uh, efforts. So far, the biological control has not been very successful on any of these pests, but we can, we can only hope and we can do research. The biological control has a lot of potential, but it is difficult and it is risky, because usually you're introducing another non-native organism uh, to, to take care of the, uh, of the pest itself. And personal actions can be helpful. You, I'm sure you all know about the Don't Move Firewood campaign because moving firewood around allows you to move the beetles that are uh, boring into it. Uh, not buying non-native plants also helps because a lot of these pests come in on uh, imported plants. And uh, if we reduce the demand for those non-native plants, then, then that helps lower that problem. But really, what needs to happen here is, is the federal policy should be strengthened to control the importation and establishment of new forest pests. So we tend to think of these um, as independent, uh, un unrelated problems, but in fact, all of these pests that have been introduced are symptomatic of one problem, and that is that our lack of, that's our lack of um, uh, adequate regulation to ensure that invasive species are not brought across our borders in the first place. So we, we started a, an effort, uh, which we, um, it, it's an initiative to try to summarize the science on the ecological and economic impacts and uh, list some policy options. And as I said before, I've been doing this in collaboration with the Science Policy Exchange. We assembled a team of ecologists, economists, and policy experts. You can see us there in, the, in front of the Cary Institute. Troy's in that picture. Uh, from the right in the, in the front row there. And we're standing under a, uh, a forest of dying hemlocks, so it was a little bit uh, ironic. But um, we, we had a workshop with this science team and with some policy advisors, and we outlined a, a paper that we would write uh, that would uh, bring together the ecological and economic impacts and also list the policy options. And that paper is now in revision. We've just sent out a, a we got the reviews back from the journal. Uh, we've made some changes, and we've sent it out to the co-authors for their approval before we resubmit it. So that, this will probably be published within the next few months. When that's published, we're going to couple it with a communication and outreach effort uh, that includes a translation piece. The, the journal article is rather technical, but we'll have a, a translation piece that's more accessible to um, uh, agency staff, to media, to the public. And we'll have a press kit and a media rollout, and we will go to uh, um, Washington, D.C. to help brief policymakers about this problem and what can be done about it. And this has to be an ongoing communication and outreach effort, so we're fully prepared to keep, uh, keep hitting on this, because nothing is going to happen policy-wise right away, but we hope it can happen eventually. I'm, I'm going to skip this one. I think you all know that. So let's talk a little bit about what policies can happen. So the first thing is that uh, we, we want to focus, we, we, we focus this effort not on controlling the spread of already established pests, but on trying to keep new pests out. So we're, we're thinking about the next pest, not, not the last one. And we want to focus on the major pathways of introduction, and those major pathways are wood and packing material, uh, crates and pellets and things like that, and also live plants that are brought in for horticulture. Both of these things, there are regulations about bringing them in, uh, but recent research has shown that uh, those regulations are ineffective and many, many pests are getting through. The current regulations for wood packing material that require heat treatment or fumigation, and uh, current regulations for most plants require a certificate from the country of origin and inspe inspection upon entry. So we know that inspection alone is not going to do the problem. There's just too much stuff coming in. There are 25 million shipping containers brought into the U.S. in 2013, 2.6 billion plants. Uh, and for those 2.6 billion plants, APHIS has 65 inspectors. So that's about 40 million plants per inspector per year. You can see that, that that's just not going to happen. Um, but those inspections are important because they provide a deterrent uh, to keep people from trying to get around the rules. 
And they also provide data as to where this stuff is coming from, which, which insects are coming in from which areas of the world, and, so, and how effective our policies are. So the, the inspections are not the answer, but they are important. The live plants, there's a number of things we can do. So when I talk to people about this, they say, this is a big problem, but, I mean, there's nothing we can do. But the, in fact, if you think about it, there are a lot of things we can do. We just have to have, to have the political will to do it. You know, one thing we could do is phase out the importation of woody plants for horticulture. So we're bringing in plants from overseas to just to plant in our, our gardens, and there really isn't any reason that we need to do that, and it's a really risky proposition. So one, one possibility is just phase that out, say so we can't bring them in. Another possibility is if we do bring them in is to have a mandatory quarantine for all imported woody plants. There's already quarantines for fruit trees and nut trees and things that are uh, agriculturally important, but, there, but if you want to plant a Japanese hemlock tree in your yard, you can do it. We could um, uh, get at this from the demand side and, and, and we could uh, work with large retailers to establish supply chain standards. So we, in the same way that uh, Home Depot has uh, certified sustainable lumber, we could have sustainable nurseries and pest-free or forest-friendly plants. We could increase the penalties. We could, you know, require importers to maintain pest-free standard in exporting nurseries. Those, these are a little squishier, a little hard to um, enforce, but uh, those are things that could be done. Uh, just an example of the quarantine, the pictures at the bottom, the one at the left is the citrus longhorn beetle, which looks quite similar to the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, they're trying to keep this, this insect out of the country. Um, they, they had a couple of, uh, of shipment of bonsai maple trees that were brought into the north, northwest, and those were quarantined. Um, and after a year or so in quarantine, they noticed these exit holes uh, in the plants, and they realized this was from citrus longhorn beetle that had exited and gotten out into the country. But because these plants were quarantined, this was all localized in a small area, they were able to find the infestation locally and uh, eradicate it. So that's just a, a success story, sort of a success story with quarantine. And the, the bug got out, but it was eradicated easily because it was all in one place. Wood packing material, this is another thing we can, we can attack. We can phase out the use of solid wood packing material because that is a very risky material. And we could replace it with wood composites or non-wood material. So, several companies are already doing this. They're not doing it from the forest pest uh, perspective, but because of their own economic reasons. Like uh, IKEA uses composite uh, wood paper materials. Uh, Trader Joe's uses entirely plastic pallets. So, you know, there are options for, for phasing this stuff out. We could uh, increase the requirements for heat treatment or fumigation. Uh, we could increase the penalties for noncompliance. That picture there on the right uh, is a piece of wood uh, material that was used in packing a load in a shipping container. The stamp on the wood indicates that it's been treated, and that grub is, uh, is an insect that crawled out of the treated wood. So you can see that treating the wood I mean, there's a couple of reasons why this might not work. One is that sometimes the treatment just doesn't kill the bugs. Uh, sometimes the, the wood is treated and then it's left out in the yard for a while and it's reinfested. And sometimes there's just fraud where that stamp is put on and it was just never treated at all. So uh, the, the treatment itself is, is just not sufficient the way it's working right now. We need to increase surveillance so we can catch these things if they do get across the border so we can catch these things and eradicate them before they spread out. And in this case, urban forests are the key. So uh, since a lot of the trade is coming into cities, uh, urban forests are the places where these outbreaks are likely to occur first. And if we have increased surveillance of urban forests, we're likely to catch them before they get out. We need to improve the data collection to evaluate the policy effectiveness. I talked about that a little bit with the inspection. And we need to establish a global pest information system so that we can see what pests are damaging what trees over in China and Japan, and we can be prepared for those pests. We might see them in this country. So just to conclude then, um, I hope uh, you agree with me. I hope I've convinced you that non-native forest pests are a, a serious and a growing problem. The economic impacts are substantial, and they fall mostly on homeowners and municipalities, not on the federal government, not on forest industry. Uh, the ecological impacts are very severe. They're very long term, and they, and they might be surprising. And there are many possible policy options for reducing the importation and establishment of these new pests. I think as biologists and ecologists, we need to raise the profile of the issue and to advocate for forest health. If we talk to people in Washington now, they say they rarely hear the voices of people advocating for forest health. They only hear the voices of the industry uh, trying to liberalize the trade rules. 
And our goal should be to bend this invasion curve. So this red line is continually going up. We need to bend that over so that it's at least going up at a lower rate or maybe even levels off entirely. So we, that would mean that we've stopped importing new pests into the country. So with that, I hope there's a few minutes left where I can take some questions and uh, talk to all of you about the issue.